and Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani. Thank you so much for joining me again today for a reading from my book, Sick Enough. Today's reading is called The Sponge Metaphor and Finding Self-Compassion. This can be found on page 126 of the book at the end of chapter nine on electrolytes and stopping purging, where I talk all about why some individuals who purge develop a lot of water retention or edema after stopping purging. When discussing dehydration, rehydration, and edema, I tell patients the sponge story. There are three types of sponges. On one side of the spectrum, there's the hard, dry sponge that's been sitting on the counter for a week. On the other side of the spectrum, there's the sopping, dripping sponge you get after running the sponge under the water. In between, there's a soft, pliable sponge that doesn't have an extra drop of water in it. I tell my patients who purge that presently, they are like the dry, hard sponge. I want to avoid making them like the sopping sponge. Instead, I want for them to be the middle sponge. To do this, we have to do the equivalent of putting the dry sponge in the sink and dripping water slowly onto it while checking it regularly, not flooding it with the faucet fully open. I recommend oral intake of food, two to three liters, that's 60 to 90 ounces, of fluids daily, and intravenous fluids if a patient has symptoms of dizziness or orthostatic vital signs that don't respond to cessation of purging. Patients with bicarbonate levels above 35 milliequivalents per liter and serum sodium levels below 130 milliequivalents per liter almost always need IV fluids. Patients with blood work that looks a little better than this and who don't have symptoms that demand IV fluids can often improve with good multidisciplinary team support, attention to purging cessation, and improvement in oral intake. Many individuals with eating disorders find that their eating disorder voice makes them react to their own thoughts, actions, accomplishments, and needs with a meanness they would never express to a loved one. I once saw my friend, the brilliant psychiatrist, Dr. Kimberly McCallum, give a lecture on mindfulness. The teaching she offered on self-compassion affected me deeply, and I've passed a version of it along to my patients ever since. I ask my patients to imagine a recent experience in which they judged themselves unkindly. They might have said to themselves, that was stupid of me, or I'm so inadequate, or what a disappointment I am. Well, everyone can learn from difficult situations and be open to doing better next time. None of these reactions are particularly constructive. They just make us feel small and empty. We must first recognize when we are being self-critical. Then we can reframe the situation and say, that was a painful experience instead of judging. The moment we relabel what occurred as painful instead of with harsh judgment, something shifts. Our inner compassion emerges fully functioning and able to soothe children, friends, and pets, if not the self, and it actually can offer comfort. We acknowledge that for whatever reason, the experience was painful for us. We can offer compassion for that fact, then rather than continue to ruminate on it, we release it and move on. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I hope you will allow yourself to take a deep breath, take care of yourself in whatever way you need to right now. And I hope you have a peaceful day.